Good evening, friends. I'm going to ask everybody to please take your seats now. We're going to get started. It's incredible to see how many people are here in this very full room at the University of Toronto in the Hart House, the Grand Room. Thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Josh Bijak. I'm the executive director of the Douglas Coldwell Layton Foundation. And tonight, we are celebrating the very first David Lewis Lecture. It's the inaugural event here at the University of Toronto. And this event, yes, let's have that. So not only am I welcoming all of you here in the room, but I'm also welcoming all of you online. I know that there are hundreds of people who are joining us from across Canada and around the world, so thank you for taking time to be here tonight. I think we have an excellent program that everyone is going to enjoy. This program tonight has been brought to you in collaboration with Woodsworth College, as well as the Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources, and the Institute for Change Leaders as one of our partners. I'd also like to thank some of our sponsors tonight. And uh, you can take a look at them there on the screen. The United Association, Local 46, ATU 113, our transit workers, thank you so much for being here with us. The Iron Workers, Local 721, and the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association, Thank you to all of our sponsors for tonight's event. Also to our partners. These are partner unions who support all of our work. The United Steelworkers of Canada, United Food and Commercial Workers, the Professional Institute of the Public Services of Canada, AMAPSIO, and the Canadian Teachers Federation, as well as LIUNA, Local 1611, BC, and Yukon. So thank you so much. I think we need a round of applause for the people who make all of this possible. So we've got an exciting program, but I think that we're, we, you know, we also have to get going. So that said, I'm very happy to introduce tonight uh, my good friend, Mike Perry, the brand new executive director of the Institute for Change Leaders, uh, to give us our indigenous welcome. Please, Mike. Tanishi Kiawao. Hello, everyone. I'm very honored to be able to lead our acknowledgement that we're meeting this afternoon on the uh, traditional lands for thousands of years of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And today this meeting is still the home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people from across Turtle Island. And I know that although we meet today among skyscrapers and, and pavement in our busy lives, Hopefully we can all take some time to reflect on and enjoy the trees that are still part of Toronto and the parkland and the lakes and rivers and also the birds and animals and the big sky above all these skyscrapers. So Marseille, merci beaucoup à tout le monde. Nguyen, chi miigwech. Thank you so much, Mike. That's very much appreciated. It's lovely sentiment and, and I know something that we all care very deeply about, so thank you. Um, you know what, this, this event, as you look around the room, you see all these people, all these friends, there's a great energy in the room, but this event, this energy that we're all feeling wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for the University of Toronto and the lovely partners that we've had at Wordsworth College and also the Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources. So with that said, I would love to invite Rafael Gomez to come on up and say a few words on behalf of the university. Thank you very much, Josh, and uh, welcome everyone to the University of Toronto. And yes, on behalf, I'll shorten it, CIRHR, it's the acronym, and Woodsworth College, I want to welcome you all here to this inaugural lecture. It's actually quite fitting, uh, we're having this lecture on November 1st. Uh, it'd be a great bookend if some of you and many of you could return here on November 30th for a very special event um, called the Sefton Williams Lecture in which uh, David Dury will speak on labor law reform and Dina Ladd will receive the Sefton Williams Prize and Award. 
And of course, that's kind of where uh, these connections happen. Um, we have a long-standing connection with the steel workers. Uh, Larry Sefton, Lynn Williams, um, both Canadian leaders of the steel workers that made a huge impact. Uh, we were fortunate enough to um, uh, welcome that um, association. It's over 40 years now that we've been holding a lecture that started in Larry Sefton's name and then added Lynn Williams. It's also nice to see a connection here with former winners of the Sefton Williams Award, Oliv our now mayor, Olivia Chow, was our award winner, and John Cartwright was our speaker, and I saw both of them here. So it's, it's nice to see that connection. Of course, Woodsworth College being named after Woodsworth, who was the, one of the co-founders of the CCF, which later became the NDP, our social democratic party in Canada. So with all these connections, it's great that I could be here to welcome you to the University of Toronto. And again, on behalf of Woodsworth College and the Centre, we're so pleased to see you here. And hopefully we'll see some of your faces here again at the end of the month on November 30th. Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you so much, Raphael. It, it really means a lot to us to have these kinds of partnerships. In fact, we've been able to go across the country this year. This is the fifth and final lecture of the lecture series that we launched this year, going to five different major universities across the country in five different cities, five different provinces, talking about social democracy and its intersection in our lives today. So, I know that you've all been eagerly anticipating the keynote, and I, I don't want to hold everything up. I'm going to quickly introduce uh, our good friend, John Weir, a professor at uh, George Brown College, but he's also a member of our board of directors, and he's got a few words not only to talk about our keynote, but then also about the person whose lecture this is in honor of, David Lewis, a person that I admire a person who, you know, when, when, I, when I learned about the work, I was inspired and, and I wanted to follow in his footsteps. And um, I hope tonight, as we reflect upon the event that we witness, we think about the work, the life, and the commitment of David Lewis. And with no further ado, John Weir. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Josh. Um, I'm not going to take up any more time than I have to because I know everyone here is very excited to hear from Marshall Gantz and, of course, from Olivia Chow. Um, but I am really excited to be here and to be able to talk a little bit about David Lewis. Um, I'm especially pleased um, because just over a year ago we stood in Woodsworth College and I talked to a much smaller crowd about one of the reasons or the need to remember David Lewis and his legacy. I think someone who's been somewhat forgotten in our discussions of the NDP CCF and its history. Um, and I'm really glad because we are here today a year later, this has come to fruition, and we're all today participating in this act of creating this new lecture series by attending and participating in this inaugural David Lewis lecture today. Um, just a little bit about David Lewis and about, I think, some of the, the similarities um, between David Lewis's time and ours. Um, this is a very difficult time in Canada. Um, we live in a society of ascendant neoliberalism and austerity politics. We all know this. Um, and that continues unchecked. You know, we worry about entering into a new recession um, that could potentially be among the worst we've experienced, at least in our lifetimes. And the plight of working people in Toronto and Canada and more broadly is getting more dire. And I'd like to say that this is a situation that's not unlike the 1972 election campaign in which David Lewis ran as the first leader of the federal NDP. Um, this was a time when hyperinflation was rampant, um, when Canada, um, the North America and the Global North, uh, and in fact the whole world were experiencing the most severe recession since the Great Depression, and really when we were beginning to see the end of the gains made in the post-war labor settlement, the beginning of a decades-long assault on working people by capital. And this was when David Lewis came to power, or came to the leadership position within the NDP, and he ran a campaign most famously known as the Corporate Welfare Bump Campaign. And what a campaign it was, right? It was a campaign calling out truth to power Sorry, I should have allowed for more clapping. The Corporate Welfare Bums <laughs> campaign. Okay, now clap. <laughs> corporate Welfare Bums, sorry. Uh, but, but what a campaign it was, right? It was a campaign that was calling out truth to power. It was a campaign that was calling out 
traditional political establishments demanding for them to consider the impacts of economic policies on working people, not just the impacts on the wealthy in our country and more broadly. And this is really sort of the campaign where David Lewis cut his teeth as the leader of the NDP, where we made some real gains, where we were able to hold the balance of power in Canadian Parliament. And in a beautiful sort of symbiosis, this is around also the time that our guest speaker, Marshall Gantz, was really sort of cutting his teeth as an organizer with the UFCW, as well as an organizer and a worker with Canada's NDP. In fact, working with David Lewis in 1974 as a canvasser on his own local campaign in York South. And, and this is the connection I want to make, the connection between David Lewis and Marshall Gantz. David Lewis was a parliamentarian, he was an MP, he was the leader of Canada's NDP, but more than anything, David Lewis was an organizer. And I think this is a really appropriate place to be talking about that at the JS Woodsworth, at Woodsworth College, um, a college that's committed to discussing labor organizing uh, and labor relations. And so what we have in our presence today in Marshall Gantz is an organizer like David Lewis. And organizers are the ones that really matter the most in our movement. They're the ones that do the hard work. Organizing transportation, making sure there's enough money, organizing conventions and fundraisers and nominations meetings, identifying talented young organizers, and then hitting the streets and doing the hard day-to-day -day work of building support for social democracy. Canvassing, mainstreeting, pamphlet dropping, all the unglamorous jobs that David Lewis spent most of his life doing. He traveled the country, he organized conventions, he made sure those candidates were in place, he made sure the money was being raised, and he kept the CCF and NDP together while always looking to expand and grow. And we're going to need organizers and a renewed emphasis on organizing if we're here to push back against the ascendant forces of capitalism, fascism, and aggression, and, and, and oppression. And that's also why I'm so glad we have Mike here from the Institute for Change Leaders. That's the work they're doing as well. And as important as organizers are, we often don't remember them as well as we should, or as much as we should, and we don't value the skills and labor that they do week in and week out as we all seek to build a better world. And that really is why I'm so pleased to welcome to this stage Marshall Gantz, because, and I say this is the greatest possible praise, Marshall Gantz is an organizer. Oh. Sorry, thanks Marshall. I actually was going to tell you all, all the organizing that Marshall has done, but I think we're all here to hear Marshall, and we all very much know the work he's done, so thank you so much, Marshall. Thank you so much. Let's see. Uh, good afternoon. Well, there's nobody out there. There's a lot of echo. What, what's the best way to... It's all right? Okay, well, let's try it again. Good afternoon. All right, good. You've got to establish that there's life here uh, in, in our conversation. Um, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to um, celebrate with you. Um, and I think for th three particular kinds of thank yous. Uh, first, the uh, Douglas Caldwell Layton Foundation. Um, from what I know, the example of moral leadership, organizational leadership, and political leadership that Tommy Douglas demonstrated is the kind of leadership that we need. Second, it's a great, I appreciate the opportunity to honor David Lewis. You know, one of the hardest things is for organizers to organize organizers. I think you may know what I'm talking about, but this, this was David's calling, uh, organizing the CCF, organizing with the CLC, organizing the NDP. And as was mentioned, I particularly was honored to have the opportunity uh, to be a canvasser in his last campaign, South York, uh, in uh, 1974. And I just want to acknowledge Michael, where are you? Michael Lewis, yeah, yes, over there as well, thank you. And I want to thank um, hosts, tutors, mentors, with whom I learned a lot about organizing. You know, in August of 1968, my partner Jessica Govea 
and a Franciscan priest, Father Mark Day, arrived in Toronto with the mission of getting Canadians to stop buying and eating California grapes. We were working then with the United Farm Workers. There had been a strike for three years trying to establish a union uh, for agricultural workers in California. Uh, and the strike was challenged, as many strikes are, so we needed to move to a boycott, a boycott of all California grapes. So it turns out that Toronto is the third largest grape market in North America. Yeah, Montreal was number five. So here we go, we arrive, and the three of us never having been here before. But the welcome was extraordinary. Um, is 15 Gervais Drive still functioning? Does that mean anything to people here? Yeah, that, that was the home of the Toronto Labor Council. Uh, I don't know if folks remember Terry Meager and, and Louis Linkinski, who were a pair uh, that hosted us. Uh, it was the home of the OFL. Uh, I think David Archer was then leading the OFL. Uh, it was also the regional office for the United Auto Workers. Dennis McDermott was then the regional director. And it was an extraordinary kind of welcome. But it wasn't a welcome just high. It was a welcome of people who were deeply involved in organizing and who saw our struggle as their struggle. And boy, did I learn a lot from that. I learned so much about how unions could work, how political parties could work. I mean, there, I, the, I went to the um, NDP convention, I think it was in London, 1968, when I thought that everybody in Canada was named Donald McDonald, uh, <laughs> the leader of the NDP, the leader of the CLC, all at the same time. And just a few other folks I want to mention, Iona Samus of the Canadian Food and Commercial Workers, uh, Keely Cummings from CUPE, uh, Lynn Williams from the Steelworkers. Uh, all these folks took our cause as theirs. And in the process, in the course of that, it was just a powerful learning experience for me. And what resulted was, well, we did a lot of things. Um, there was the day we tried to stop the grape train from coming in at Sarnia. This was organized by the OCAW and the UAW. There's a grape, grape train, it brings grapes, right? And so there was a whole thing to stop the grape train. Uh, there was uh, our, first, uh, uh, our first boycott day, official California grape boycott day was Toronto City Hall. Uh, I think David Crombie was the mayor then. Um, there, there were delegations, there were rallies, there, were the, there was the grape train, but I want to share just one story with you. Uh, this, is, this is about Dominion stores, uh, because we took on Dominion stores as the, the chain we needed to get to stop selling California grapes in order to get Loblaws and Steinbergs, and I don't know if they still exist, but uh, that was the strategy. And we'd been successful in getting virtually grapes out of virtually all the Dominion stores in Toronto, but there were about three left. And it was shortly before Easter. And we're trying to figure out what do we do about to close the deal? And we were working with a team of young people from St. Michael's College. Uh, and uh, they, um, uh, we were saying, what are we gonna do, what are we gonna do? So we're sitting around and one of them says, well, you know, it's gonna be Easter soon and I have these uh, bunny suits. Now, what if we all dressed up as bunnies and we went and hopped into Dominion stores and stood in front of the grapes and said, boycott grapes. Well, then I said, yeah, that's fine, but you know, I just had this party and you know what, we have balloons and we have helium. Now what if the bunnies took balloons and then tied the grapes to the balloons so the grapes would go up? And so, so next Saturday, uh, the van arrived, opened the doors, the bunnies hop out of the van, they hop into the Dominion store, uh, and uh, they go to the grapes, they tie, the grapes go up in the air, and then the manager comes and pops the balloons. Okay, so then we had to have a, uh, what we call a plus and delta reflection session on what do we do now? The same guy that had the balloons turns out, he said, hey, you know what else I have? 
confetti. Ah, okay. So next Saturday, the van pulls up, bunnies hop out, bunnies hop into the store, they're in front, they tie the grapes, they send it up in the air, and the manager comes out with a big spike, boom, confetti everywhere. <laughs> the next, <laughs> that was on a Saturday. On Monday, Dominion issued a statement saying that because of uh, uh, a vandalism and, uh, by union goons, they had decided to withdraw California grapes from sale. So, and there, there was a friendly commentator, Bruno Gerussi, who had a program here then. And he uh, opened his program by saying uh, he wants to uh, recognize the success of the farm workers, and he had a poem. And the poem was this, if all the goons used toy balloons and filled them with confetti, then cops and crooks would use dirty looks and guns that shoot spaghetti. Congratulations to the farm workers. So thank you to Bruno for that. But the fight wasn't over because then we returned in 1973 for round two. And here from 73 to 75. And of course, all that wonderful support from the, uh, the unions, from the NDP and so forth. What was added to it, the faith communities uh, played a major role in that second round. It turns out we were the first social action project of the Toronto Archdiocese. Uh, and as such, uh, folks were our people, because we came with 27 people at that time, farm workers, families, whole thing. And so our folks were housed at Scarborough Foreign Mission. Uh, St. Basil's Seminary uh, housed a lot of the single guys. Uh, there was Regis College with the Jesuits that took people in. Our families that were with us lived in a house of St. Vincent de Paul. And I'm only mentioning this to say the breadth of support here was extraordinary. And as a result of that, two years later, in 1975, we were successful in winning the very first collective bargaining law that enabled agricultural workers to organize unions and establish contracts and not just disappear when a strike was over. So, and... And, and I want to recognize, um, uh, there's a few people here, I think, who actually then came with us out to California for those elections in Salinas Valley in 1975. Bill Howes, where's Bill? Is Bill here somewhere? I saw Bill. Yeah, Bill's back there. Uh, uh, Bill was with the CLC and Ed Seymour was with the uh, textile workers back there. There may have been others, I don't know. But, and there were other people like Jim Gill, Linda Hunter, uh, uh, Aubrey Golden, our lawyer, Val Taylor, um, and, and, and especially our friend, uh, organizer, and close collaborator, uh, Patty Park, who we lost in 2012, some 10 years ago. So I'm just sharing this to, as, a, as a, an, an expression of appreciation because you don't learn organizing by reading a book, you learn it by doing it. And this city, and Canada, but particularly Toronto, was so welcoming, and we learned so much. Um, I'll just, one other, there was Christmas of 69. Uh, we were trying to get Loblaws to cooperate. And so we uh, did a 10-day fast in front of Loblaws before Christmas. And it was accompanied with a 24-hour vigil. And people were signed up for every single hour. It was cold. I remember the seafarers had a, had a little van where you could go get warm across the street. Uh, and I particularly remember Keeley Cummings as signing up for those early morning hours that were really tough. So yeah, this is a lot of heart. And it isn't just heart. It's also head. It's also hands. It's also skill. And we owe so much of our successes in California to your work here. So thank you. Thank you for that. But that was then, and this is now. And uh, my good friend, uh, we lost uh, Tom Hayden, once observed that change is slow except when it's fast. This is a fast moment, isn't it? 
and it's a fast moment. And fast moments can be fraught with danger, but also opportunity. You know, in fast moments, chickens come home to roost, inconvenient truths have to be faced, climate change is real, inequality is real. Um, the last 30 years uh, of it, uh, the role that money plays in our political life is real. The struggles over race, gender, uh, religion, and class are real. The dehumanization that we experience when we're turned into data points or we're turned into cost centers or, we're current, or profit centers uh, is real. And so there's some real tough stuff happening. Now, it's not news to anybody here. So I think the first thing we have to do when, is to acknowledge what's happening. And, and, and that can be itself challenging because in this kind of a moment some of, of this radical uncertainty, some folks try to find safety behind walls, uh, in sameness, uh, in predictability, in the past. But safety isn't to be found behind walls. It's just to live with more fear. What the world needs a whole lot more than walls and safety is bravery because it's through courage, hearts strong enough to engage with each other, learn with each other, and discover with each other how we can meet this challenge. So in that context, this is one of the reasons leadership matters so much right now and one of the reasons that organizing matters so much right now. But I want to be clear what I'm talking about when I'm talking about leadership. Because, um, well, you know, a lot of people have ideas about leadership, and so I want to be clear what I'm talking about. The, my understanding of leadership is rooted in three questions posed by a first century Jerusalem scholar, Rabbi Hillel, who when asked, what do I do with my life? responded with three questions to ask yourself. And the first one was, ask yourself, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? Now, that's not meant to be a selfish question. It's a self-regarding question. If you presume to engage with others, you better be clear about yourself, your own self-awareness, your values, to actually be able to see others. But then the second question is, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Because to be a who and not a what, a human being and not a thing, is to recognize that we are relational creatures. We exist in relationship with others in the world. Our capacity to realize our objectives is inextricably bound up with the capacity of others to realize theirs. And finally, he says, ask yourself, if not now, when? It's not advice to jump into moving traffic. It is a caution against what Jane Addams called the snare of preparation. We're going to spend a year, we're going to come up with the perfect strategic plan, we're going to implement, and the world will totally conform to our expectations. Has that ever happened to you? It's never happened to me. See, the point is that rarely can we learn to do well what we want to do until we actually begin to do it. That understanding flows from action, not preceding it. And so for me, leadership is about the interaction of those three elements of self, other, and action. It also points to the context in which leadership matters. Um, I don't know, have you had experience in any organizations or projects you've been in where uh, everything's going really great and so there's a whole long line of people saying, uh, where's the leadership so we can thank them? <laughs> yeah, I hear the laughter. Uh, yeah, when, what are people lining up out there? It's the problems, the dilemmas, the contradictions, the challenges. And it points to the fact that, that the, when everything's working fine, what do you need leadership for? It is the dilemmas, the contradictions, the uncertainties. That's when the critical contribution of creative, imaginative, uh, initiative-taking leadership really matters. And that can be challenging to accept because uncertainty Uncertainty brings with it a lot of stuff, you know? We ask ourselves, do we have the skills to deal with these new challenges? And that's a challenge to the hands. Can we use our resources in new ways? A strategic challenge, challenge to the head. 
And then there's where to get the hope, where to get the courage, how to inspire the hope and courage in others that it takes to confront and to take the risks that are often necessary to deal with real challenges, and that's a challenge of the heart. So it's a way of thinking of leadership in a head, hands, heart kind of way. And we tend to reduce it to one or the other, but it's all three. So the definition that I've come to use for leadership is that it is about accepting responsibility, because there's a choice, for enabling others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. So this is not leader as diva. This is not leader as the sun that illuminates or burns, or whatever it does. It's a form of engagement with other people around, around the accomplishment of shared purpose. And it's also not to be, uh, you know, sometimes we confuse authority and leadership. But, you know, I think we can all think of examples of people who occupied formal positions of authority that turned out to be pretty lousy leaders. I got a few from my country if you're looking for, uh, for some examples. On the other hand, it is a fact that we meet people in neighborhoods, work sites, and communities who are exercising leadership in the way I'm describing it without the title, without the formal designation, but because that's what they do. So for me, that's what leadership's about. And organizing is a particular form of leadership that begins by asking first, who are my people? Not what's my issue. Who are my people? With whom am I entering into this relationship? Thinking of leadership as relationship, not performance. It's different. And then what is the change they need in terms of their lived experience, the pain points, the hope points, the realities there? Not because somebody said they think they need this. And thirdly is how to work with people so as to translate, enable them to translate their resources resources they have into the power they need to create the change they want. So those three elements uh, kind of, for me, are a lot what organizing is about. And, and it is also about power. And, you know, well, it's one of the things that doesn't get talked about. <laughs> Uh, at least at the Kennedy School where the economists rule, uh, we, don't talk, we talk about efficiency, we want to talk about power. But power is what shapes it all. And, and you know, power is just very intuitive. If you need what I've got more than I need what you've got, who's got the power? You need what I've got more than I need what you've got, who's got the power? Yeah? And what if it's reversed, then who's got the power? Because it's understanding that power is not a thing. It's a relationship of influence between needs and resources. And I think, think understanding it that way opens up a whole lot of different kinds of strategic possibilities that are not there if we get stuck on so-and-so has the power. You know, there's a saying in Spanish, al uh, nopal no se viene a ver solo cuando tiene tuna, which means people come and look at the prickly pear cactus only when it's bearing fruit which is often used in the barrios to describe the politicians that show up just before election. There's some fruit here, okay, hi. Uh, and then afterwards, all that's left is the spines. And so they don't seem to show up that much. The point is, it's intuitive, but it is this kind of influence that we can build with one another or that we can figure out how to exercise over those whose resources we need in order to meet our needs and are in fact depriving us of the needs that we have. And I just want to read you one thing about this uh, from, uh, this is uh, interesting, it's uh, Pope Francis. I don't know if there's any Pope Francis fans here, but, but I'm sure one. Uh, and uh, in his encyclical, uh, 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 Fratelli Tutti, we're all brothers, he has this passage, he says, we are called to love everyone without exception. At the same time, loving an oppressor does not mean allowing him to keep oppressing us or letting him think that what he does is acceptable. On the contrary, true love for an oppressor means seeking ways to make him cease his oppression. It means stripping him of power that he does not know how to use and that diminishes his own humanity and that of others. Those who suffer injustice have to defend strenuously their own rights and those of their family precisely because 
they must preserve the dignity they have received as a loving gift from God. It's a pretty good summary, isn't it? It's a pretty good summary. So it's, it's comfort with, yeah, this is about power. It's also about community. It's also about leadership. And when we look for outcomes in organizing, we're not just looking for winning the campaign. Yes, that's important. You ever been on a campaign where you may have won, but you never wanted to see anybody ever again who was, <laughs> oh, I see. That's also not a uniquely American experience. Well, when you really think about it for a minute, if what you're trying to do is build power and what you wind up with is weaker than we started, that's not such a good deal. And so you're really looking for three outcomes. You want to win, but you want to come out more powerful than you went into it. And third, you want to come out having developed more leadership because leadership in the way I'm describing it is really uh, critical for all this kind of work. Now, this, uh, I just want to share with you a little bit like where this understanding comes from. Um, you know, the three questions I started with about, about uh, myself, us, and, and now, really, the first place I found them was not at the Kennedy School or at Harvard. It was actually in the book of Exodus chapter 8. Now, I've always been a Moses fan, or Nebi Musa, as is also known, because he's the Jew who was an Egyptian. He was of the oppressed, but raised in the house of the oppressor. And that created certain identity issues and certain challenges, and he's struggling with it, and his rage takes over, and he kills somebody, so then you have to go off into the desert, which is where you go uh, to figure stuff out in the Bible. Uh, and, and he finds, uh, and he, and he, and he finds uh, a wife, he finds a father-in-law, uh, he gets a job as a shepherd, and one day he's walking along with his sheep, and he sees a glow off the side of the road, and, uh, and he's curious, he steps off the road, and it's this bush that's burning, and it's not being consumed. And at that point, he hears the voice, Moses, or Moses, there's some theological contention as to the tone of the voice that called him. Uh, you are called to free your people. And for folks familiar with the text, uh, how does Moses respond? Yeah, sign me up, I'm ready to go. I'm your guy. Uh-uh, you got the wrong guy. I got a speech impediment. I can't even give a, give a speech. And wait a second, who are you and these people? And um, couldn't this wait? And that's when God negotiates his brother's help and the staff that turns into a snake and so forth. The point is, these questions I started with about those three Hillel questions, people have been asking themselves these questions for a long, long time. And, you know, the context changes, the cultures change, but these questions are around. And the first time I asked myself these questions with any seriousness was in 1964 when I volunteered for the Mississippi Summer Project. Uh, I was uh, in third year at, at uh, Harvard working on my undergraduate degree. And um, it was a moment of, it was an extraordinary moment. Uh, the problem was that black organizers organizing Mississippi were getting put in jail, they were getting beaten worse, and, and because the law didn't protect them. And so the idea was then bring people from elite northern colleges, black and white, and maybe they'll bring the law with them. And so the idea was to go to Mississippi and support black organizers who were organizing the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which was a parallel organization to the segregated Democrats. And we were going to the Democratic Convention, get them thrown out and get our folks seated. But we were in Oxford, Ohio being trained. And uh, it was the next day we were going to go to Mississippi and we got word that three of our party disappeared. Uh, Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, and James Cheney. They had been uh, sent down a week before, so, yeah, a week before to investigate the burning of a uh, black church in Philadelphia, Mississippi, where there'd been civil rights activity and they hadn't been heard from since. Bob Moses was the lead organizer, uh, called us all together in uh, like a high school auditorium, there were about 300 of us, and he said, we just got word what happened to our brothers. We don't know exactly what happened, but we think they're gone. 
And sure, a month, sure, sure enough, two months later, their bullet-riddled, beaten bodies were found uh, buried in a dirt levee where the Klan had buried them after executing them when the county sheriff had turned them over to the, to the Klan for that purpose. Now, we didn't know that, but we kind of knew that. And so Bob said, look, I'd like to tell everybody, just, just go home. You, you don't need to do this. He said, but I can't. I have to ask you to go. But he said, I can't take the whole responsibility. Everybody here has got to decide. Utter silence. And I sank into my chair just like everybody there saying, oh, wow, what did I get into here? This is this what I signed up for? So you ask yourself. My father was a rabbi, my mother a teacher. We lived in Germany for three years after the Second World War, 1946-49. And a lot of his work was with Holocaust survivors. My, my fifth birthday party was actually in a DP camp, displaced person camp, of all children, which I thought was cool until I understood why it was only children. The parents were gone. So that was a reality in my home. But my parents interpreted that to me as not being simply about anti-Semitism, but about racism. And that racism kills, turn people into objects, you can do anything with them. And of course, Dr. King, the civil rights movement, was challenging the institutionalized racism, fundamental to the United States since even before its founding. Now, I don't know if there's any, you know what a PK is? Are there any PKs here? Preacher's kid, yeah, preacher's kid, pastor's kid. There's RKs, there's also IKs. But the, the thing is, uh, you have to go to all the stuff. You're also supposed to be perfect. There's a different set of issues. We have a support group for that. But, but I did love the Passover Seder. I loved the telling of the Exodus story with food and that journey from slavery to freedom. And you... You, they would point to the children and say, you were slaves in Egypt. I said, I've never been to Egypt, I've never been a slave. It took a while for me to figure out that that story was not the property of one people or one time or one place. It's told generation after generation. You kind of have to figure out, are you with those guys with the horses and the chariots? Or are you with those people who are trying, their, trying to find their way to a land of promise? Well, Dr. King, <laughs> Dr. King, Dr. King described the Civil Rights Movement as yet another chapter in that same story. And, you know, the other thing, I was 20 at the time. Others were 18, 19, 21, 22. The Civil Rights Movement was a movement of young people. Very important to remember that. There's a Protestant theologian, Walter Brueggemann, wrote a book called The Prophetic Imagination, where he says that transformational vision occurs at the intersection of two elements. One he calls criticality a clear view of the world's hurt, of its need, of its pain, coupled with hope, a sense of the world's promise, of its possibilities. And young people come of age with a critical eye on the world they find in almost of necessity hopeful hearts. And that convergence then, without that, the, the, uh, the critical eye can just lead to despair. And the other hopefulness without recognizing that to apathy Together, they create a powerful tension that can be transformational. And it was that for my generation. I think it is for this generation as well. It is one of the missions of young people is to challenge, to renew, and to put hope into practice. So as we're sitting there all in silence, a young woman named Jean Wheeler stands up in the back and she starts to sing. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. They say, freedom is a constant struggle. Oh, Lord, we've struggled so long. We must be free. They say, freedom is a constant dying. We've died too long. We must be free. And as she stood up and began to walk out of the room, everybody filed in behind her. And the next day, everybody went to Mississippi. Now, that for me was a real choice point. Uh, because with all due respect to Harvard, my education about race, power, and politics was in Mississippi. Because the inequalities were so stark, uh, you know, uh, but it was also, I mean, with housing, healthcare, education, whites were here and blacks were here. But it was also clear that bringing a few books or medical supplies would be a nice thing, it wasn't going to change anything. And that's when I began to learn the difference between charity and justice. That charity says, what's wrong? Let me help. Justice says, why is it happening? How can we stop it? How can we change it? That was really fundamental to understanding organizing for me because then it was the question, how do we change it? And you know, a lot of times people think that power is located just in the high places, 
But what we discovered in the civil rights movement, I think the real legacy of, everybody heard of Rosa Parks? One lady who one day got, just got tired. No, she was, she was secretary of the NAACP chapter. The whole thing was a strategy. She needed to get arrested because he wanted to file a lawsuit to challenge segregated transportation. And so she got arrested, but she went to jail, but the women's committee of the Black College said, we can't let her go to jail by herself. Uh, we got to show solidarity, convince King and the others to get everybody to stay off the buses for one day. And there's a great account, Dr. King gets up early in the morning, sees the buses go by, there isn't a single black face on a single bus. And that moment, that community saw itself differently. You know, powerlessness divides and fragments you, but that kind of unity empowers. And so that community decided to stay off the buses until they won. That was the Montgomery bus boycott. It took a year, they did win. But what they discovered in it was people, in fact, do have resources that become sources of power. In this case, what was the resource everybody had? If you look down, what do you see? What do you see? It turns out everybody had feet. And if they used their feet to walk to work and deny the bus company the bus fare, instead of using their feet to get on the, the bus and give the bus company the bus fare, then their individual dependency could be turned into collective power. And that, for me, was magic. That was organizing. So instead of going back to finish my year at Harvard, uh, I went back to California where I grew up in Central Valley. Cesar Chavez had just started organizing migrant farm workers and began to work with him for the next 16 years, which was really the other place I learned the organizing craft. I'd grown up in the middle of that world, but I hadn't seen it. I had to go to Mississippi, get what we call Mississippi eyes, to come back home, see another community of people of color, also without political rights, also without economic rights, uh, and uh, California with its own rich history of racial oppression, beginning with the native peoples, the Chinese, Japanese, and so So it turned out that Mississippi was not an exception to America, it was an example of the America we needed to change. So I began to work with Caesar, did that for the next 16 years, which is really where I learned the organizing craft, including my time here in Toronto. Uh, left in 81, did another 10 years of union issue and electoral organizing, and then was invited to my 25th reunion at Harvard. Uh, I was surprised, uh, you know, uh, they, I was a dropout. You might drop out, see reunions, is that what it, well, if you if you're started a small software company up in Seattle, yeah, it can make sense to, to but, not, but not, for, not for me. But I went, and it was like running into a 20-year-old a version. How's it going? I said, I'm feeling stuck. Uh, I'm feeling stuck. Well, why don't you come back and finish that senior year? So I don't know, the synapses, I don't know, you know, tuition had changed this a little bit. Uh, and they, but we figured it out. So in 1991, I came back, uh, finished my senior year, wrote a senior thesis in history and government, and graduated class of 64-92. And my 81-year-old mother got to come and finally see her son become a college graduate. But I got hooked, uh, did a master's at the Kennedy School, PhD in sociology, and was asked to teach organizing, and that was the gift to me because I could integrate my life experience with the social science I was learning in a pedagogical conversation with the rising generation. It was like, I get to go to class twice a week and have a conversation with the future. I mean, how cool is that? So I've been on the faculty full-time since 2000, uh, teach organizing in the spring, online and offline. I think, do we have any online people who participated in our online classes, Mike here? over there, over there. Yeah, this is really a kind of cool thing of learning with people from about 30 different countries. And, but learning practice, not theory, learning how to actually do it. I teach that in the spring uh, and in the fall public narrative online and offline. Got back involved in the world of action, mainly through my students with the Obama campaign 2007 and 2008 and since then, been working with people around the world who are trying to figure out how do we turn our values into sources of power so that we can create a world into which we want our children to live. That to me has been a blessing, to be able to do that work, to be able to engage with people. And when we share this, the whole thing is about developing leadership, about building community around leadership and building power from community. And we focus on five practices that I, I, we can talk about. One, 
But the first one I want to mention is relationship, building relationships. Everything today mitigates against relationship. It turns us into transactions. And relationship is where we actually uh, do enough work with each other to determine if we have enough shared values to build a future. Because that's what relationships are about. Transactions are nothing. Relationships build a future. And that's, that's fundamental to the whole work of organizing and social change, is the relationships we build with each other. Second is, uh, is storytelling. And a lot of people familiar with our work on public narrative. It's about how to translate the emotional content of our values into the resources for hope, for courage, for solidarity, for the emotional work we need to do in order to be able to take risks. Uh, the third is strategizing, how to turn what you have into what you need to get what you want. I mean, that's really, again, every one of the things I mentioned are things everyone is capable of doing. Because we do them every day. We Ever oversleep? You have to strategize. Ever heard a story? Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you build relationships? Yeah, well, they don't have to all be good ones, but, you know, build relationships. So, and then, uh, then comes action how we actually make facts on the ground happen. I was taught if you can't count it, it didn't happen. And, find, and we get, anyway, uh, we can talk more about that. And finally is structure. And I just want to say a word about structure because a lot of times we experience it as negative, as problematic, because we've had to deal with oppressive structure. But without structure, there is no future either. The word comes from a Latin, it means to build, and all it is is commitments we make to one another about how we're gonna work together. Otherwise, what happens so much is like uh, Wile E. Coyote. You know Wile E. Coyote, uh, in the road, you know, he runs off the cliff, looks down, nothing there. That is what too often happens with these mobilizations that are not in the context of structure, of organized structure, organized leadership that enables us to decide, to strategize, and all the rest. Well, look, I, my time's up, I'm over time. Uh, and uh, so I, I'm just gonna, I just wanna conclude with a song that I'm not gonna sing. Uh, because in the third grade I was told, please just mouth the words. And uh, you know, it's a very mean teacher. Uh, but this is a, a, a song recorded by Judy Collins in the 60s in the context of the civil rights movement. And it goes like this. Freedom doesn't come like a bird on the wing, doesn't fall down like the summer rain. Freedom, freedom is a hard one thing. You have to work for it, you have to fight for it, day and night for it, and every generation has to win it again. Pass it on to your children, brother. Pass it on to your children, sister. They have to work for it. They have to fight for it, day and night for it, and every generation has to win it again pass it on to your children, pass it on, and thank you so much for the opportunity to pass some of it on. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, that was really, really inspiring. Uh, please, please join us in one of those chairs. Can I just teach them how to applaud? Yeah, sure. Okay, just, just one other thing. I, I want to share uh, instruction on how to applaud. Uh, when, when I was with the farm workers, uh, we applauded like that. And a guy named Luis Valdez, who started the Teatro Campesino, brought music and theater and all to, into the movement. And he said, you know, I don't understand this. You guys applaud, but you applaud chaotically. You're supposed to be, you have momentum. You're supposed to be a movement, dynamic, unity. But uh, I don't hear it. So he taught us how to applaud in this way. Join me. Now, one, one addition. I uh, was doing a Latino Camp Obama in New Mexico, and a young woman had been organizing the Filipino community. She said, uh, we don't think that has enough solidarity. So she added this, join me again. That's solidarity. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Marshall. Yeah, please uh, have a seat. Uh, thank you so much. That was, that was really uh, amazing. You know, I, I love the personal stories. Um, and just so you know, too, um, you know, my wife and I were down in 2008, Erie, Pennsylvania, 
exercising exactly your strategy, canvassing for the Obama campaign. And I got to tell you, there were people in those communities that we visited who had never been canvassed before. And it's, it's thanks to uh, much of your work that we were even there. I also got to tell you, that was quite the Montley crew. I know that, that, that he is smiling and laughing. I'll tell you the story later. We don't have time tonight, but that is a great story and I'm sure motivational for many canvassers. Um, we have somebody who's going to come up and talk with Marshall, but before we do that, I'm going to invite my very good friend, Ken Newman, former National Director of the United Steelworkers, to come on up and introduce our very most VIP here in the room. And so, Ken, thank you so much for doing that. <laughs> Cheers, Ken. Well, thank you very much, Josh, and uh, let me, uh, let's uh, give another round of applause for that great presentation from Marshall Gans. <laughs> Wonderful. Let me uh, also uh, bring greetings on behalf of uh, Marty Warren, the National Director of the Steelworkers, and as you know, we're partners of the Caldwell, uh, uh, Douglas Caldwell Foundation in Leighton. Uh, we're very honored to be part and parcel of this great uh, institution. Uh, we're so grateful to, uh, to have you, Marshall, talk to us about organizing and coming from the labor movement, knowing the importance of what that is, uh, of being out there in the forefront. And uh, I know we've learned so much from your teachings over the years, and we're grateful for that. Uh, relationships are the heart of organizing, as you say, and that's something that you have shared uh, uh, with us and it's something that our next speaker knows very much uh, about. Uh, her whole life, uh, she has been involved in uh, building relationships, be it in the community, uh, fighting for people uh, uh, from all walks of life. Uh, her early days of activism as being the city councillor, also as a member of parliament, and also her honoring her, her institute for change leaders, the uh, folks that she has been able to train in regards to organizing across the country. It's truly a pleasure to invite our next speaker, our great mayor, Olivia Chow. this life? Yep. Wow, that's a lot to digest in each of the elements that Marsha have talked about. It, we could spend hours. We are at a time when our opinions might be different. Our judgment on some things are different. You talked about canvassing. Mm -hmm. When we are canvassing, often we just say, this is what we want. But you talk about building relationship. Mm -hmm. You talked about experience and about shared value. Mm -hmm. How do we activate that? How do we get the stories out there so we relate with each other through our experience? Where do we start on that? Well, step one, step two, no, I'm kidding. You can't. <laughs> no, you, it, you, like, yeah, maybe no, you, can, you can maybe think of uh, yeah. some kind of example yeah. uh, on, even on the great boycott because you couldn't speak Spanish, you know? Many other unions tried, and they failed. I, I think, oh, sorry. I think first it comes back to that element of relationship. Because uh, relationship is not to categorize people. It is to see people, and to be seen by people, and to be heard, and to hear people, to value people, and to be valued. It's. It, it's, it comes down to a kind of respect where we're not looking at the other person as an object or a category, but as a, a, a human being. But then that takes paying a lot of attention. 
And the work we do in public narrative, in the story of self-work, I don't know how f familiar folks are with that, it's working with people to uh, enable them to articulate why they care about what they care about, where their hope comes from, if it's there, why they're called to do what they do. It's not about how to put on a front. It's not about how to package yourself. It's about to open yourself to enough vulnerability that you can be seen because others will let you see them only if you let them see you. And, and vulnerability is not a, vulnerability is almost a condition of courage. You know, because, yeah, no fear, okay. Don't learn anything from that. And by vulnerability, I don't mean, I, I don't mean commiseration and all that, but I mean acknowledgement that we're all, we all struggle and we're all trying to do what we're trying to do and most of us need help. Not like, oh, please help me, but we need others. We need to engage with others. I think that kind of basic work, and look, that sort of thing's been done by faith traditions over the years, by, so it's not something new, but it's something, boy, do we need it now, to be able to actually see one another and then see in who we are together what are the values we share. You know, this public narrative work that we do about story of self, story of us, story of now, it really surprised me because the first time we did it outside the United States was in the UK with the NHS. And Br Brits will never uh, be vulnerable. Uh, it's just not, you know, <laughs> stiff upper lip. Well, it took about 10 minutes. Uh, and then the work we did in the Middle East, in, in, uh, no, in, in the Arab world, this won't happen. And then in Japan, Japan was really interesting because there was not permission to talk about yourself, but once an environment was created of respect and of hearing and of learning, wow, the, the energy released was just, it was one of the best workshops I was ever in. So we're talking about really basic human stuff, but with intentionality, with craft, with purpose, so that you can build the kinds of relationships that really are relational foundations. That doesn't happen automatically. And it sure doesn't happen when we're putting people in categories and boxes. When, when we work at developing an us, it's not a categorical us, everybody with brown hair. It's shared experience, shared values. And stories are what enable us to communicate that and share that, so this is not an extra, it's a foundation that then enables all that other good stuff, the strategy and all that, to actually be motivated, to actually happen, and to be willing to take the risks involved in doing that. So that's a long answer. To, it's not an answer. It, it it's is, just another it set of questions, really. <laughs> so it's really a calling for us to be able to be vulnerable and then have the courage to tell other people what's sometimes hurt or painful. And that story that shaped who we are. And once we are able to tell that story and we can then connect through those experience with each other, then our relationship is then deep deeply connected through our shared values. But us New Democrats often like to rush into judgment because we are right, yeah? We have justice on our side, right? Yeah. Well, then we are judgmental. How can you say that I'm wrong? How could I admit that my point of view is wrong? So, in some ways, you are asking us to maybe from time to time park our opinions for the time being, still believe in core values, yeah, I, but be able to see each other and then build that relationship through experience? Yes, yes, <laughs> and, but, and let me say this a bit more. This is not something you do in a weekend workshop. This is something you live. Throughout and your life. It, it really is. I mean, yeah. it is a way of engaging with other people. 
And, and it's also not confusing uh, issues with values. Uh, there's a common thing. I know in the States is a big deal. I'm a tree person, okay? You're a fish person. Well, geez, I got to get that donor to give me the money for the trees, and you got to get them for the fish. And so, and so we never build enough power to do anything about trees or fish because we're so busy fragmenting around an issue. Now, the fact is that we both value the natural world. We believe that it has deep value. Now, if we can come together around that, then we can make strategic choices about what issue advances our interests in this context. And it's a different way to look at it. It's starting with values, and then it's moving from that to, to, to strategy. In other words, how do we realize this value to which we're committed about health or whatever? How do we turn that into strategy? And so, in some ways, the challenge for social democrats is to connect our story yes. with our collective new story of what it means, of the story of social democrats, and then have that core value connect with the people that are out, you know, that we talk to, yeah. and then build that relationship. Yes, it's a, it's a, it, sorry, <laughs> thank you. Boy, it's good to have a mayor on your side because it, <laughs> no, no, it, and, it, and again, it, it yes. Uh, if we can move into that, see, this is where the storytelling and where the relational work really matters. If we can move into that domain of discourse, then we've got something real. Now, some of our opponents, I, want to, I don't want to say opponents more than that, in the U.S., on the far right, they have actually been doing this work Very with their well. base. Yes. Only their reaction to distress, which is genuine and real, is based not on hope but on fear. Because you can mobilize people around hope or fear, and if you mobilize around fear, then the anger turns into hate, it turns into somebody else's fault, it turns into I'm the savior and I will save you, just identify with me. In other words, it undermines people's agency and turns them into dependence, whereas if you go with hope, uh, it's, uh, you're going a different, you're enhancing people's agency and their sense of self and ability to make choices. And I just want to say about hope one thing. Because when I say hope. This is so important to hear. When I say hope, okay. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when I'm talking about hope, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, uh, flowers in May, oh, it'll all be fine. That, that's not hopeful. That's just fantasy. Uh, it's the definition that I find most useful is that of Maimonides, the 12th century philosopher, who said that hope is belief in the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. What he's saying is that we live in a world in which it is always probable Goliath will win, but sometimes David does. That it was utterly improbable. We had elected a black man president of the United States in 2007. It happened. In other words, there is a place between certainty and fantasy, which is could be, which is that domain of possibility. Boy, we need to cultivate that because that's where strategy comes from, that's where creativity. So, so it's not about, hey, everything's gonna be okay. It's looking at reality clearly, but then doing the work to find within ourselves and others the capacity to generate possibilities. Not certainties, but possibilities. Because then we have something to build and often that strength comes from each other. Because we don't fight these things alone. I mean, you can't, can't it's, it's with others. Yeah. Um, often when we see injustice, we want to do something. We want to change a government or change in Instant. And, and we often confuse what strategy is by rushing out, there's a petition, let's do a petition, let's do a big rally in front of whichever place. Um, 
Those are <laughs> tactics, is it? What's the difference yeah. between, like, we may be, but those tactics is what we used to do, and usually we rush into doing them, yeah. and sometimes they don't work. Yes. How is it? What's the difference between strategy and tactics? Well, the way I've come to think about, first of all, is understanding what is strategy. And I think at the basic level, it's how to turn what you have into what you need to go what you want. I mean, it's something we do all the time. Anytime we've overslept, we strategize. And so it, it's, a, it's a thing. But the word strategy comes from the Greek, uh, strata, was what uh, was a Greek for the f for a field, and the army was called a strata because it was supposed to take the field, and the general was called the strategos, and strategos would go up on top of the hill, and come up with a theory of change, uh, come up with a hypothesis. If we deploy our people this way, that way, this is likely to happen. The soldiers down in the valley they were called tacticas. In other words, they were the activities. So strategy and tactics, there's the theory of change, and then there's the activities to turn that theory into reality. And where we get confused is when we confuse the two, and we say, somebody did something, let's have a petition. That's right. well, well, then why have a petition? Well, that's what we always do. That's not strategy. <laughs> that's not that's, that's habit. That's habit. Marshall, yeah. I actually have a big event at City Hall. Oh, um, I so hope it, I hope I'm it's going strategic. to. It is strategic because <laughs> let me tell you what it is. It is about building relationships. Oh, that's good. Every year, every summer, the city of Toronto has all these taste of Little Italy, taste of Danforth, taste of everything. Every, everybody gone to taste of something, right? <laughs> so it's a big street party. They're organized by volunteers. Uh -huh. There are hundreds of them. So tonight, I've hosted, starting at 6 o'clock, a big party at City Hall <clears throat> celebrating the, uh, these, this business improvement area, these small business yeah. people to, that they volunteer to organize. I want them to think not just about organizing the street and getting yeah. close in the street, having people, but also organizing to build more affordable housing and all that. So I have to run all, yes, build more affordable housing. So I'm, I'm using that building relationship in organizing them. But this is a really important element of strategy and tactics. And I'm wondering, Mike Perry, who is one of the most best, one of your students here, who is the executive director who took your course, <laughs> and I'm wondering whether he can finish this fireside chat for the next five, ten minutes, if that's okay, Marshall, oh, it's because fine. I have to run off. Thank you so much for allowing me to share a few minutes with you. But don't, don't go yet. Don't go. We need you to finish the question. Yeah. Should we stand or what should we want to stand? The stage is looking a lot bigger when you get up here, and this chair, you know, a lot bigger. Um, just to pick up, I think, where Olivia and you had uh, were going with that, Marshall, can you talk a little bit about the difference uh, between strategy and actual organizing? or between mobilization and organizing? Because I think a lot of times we mobilize, but then the mobilization goes away. But I'll leave it to, to you, please. Yeah, the, the mobilizing without organizing is, that's the Wiley e. Coyote problem. Um, uh, you know, you know Wiley e. Coyote runs off the cliff, nothing down there. And so we're doing all this mobilizing, and then nothing changes. A classic is the uh, Wael Gonim, who was the Google guy in Tahrir Square uh, in when Arab Spring. And they did an amazing job of mobilizing. So much they were able to get rid of Mubarak. But who wound up with the goodies? The Muslim Brotherhood wound up because they had organization, and then ultimately the military. So it's kind of mobilizing in the absence of organizing. It's, it just, it flies. Now there are moments to mobilize, no question about it, 
but if it comes then out of a strategy, and you have to have organization to strategize. I mean, strategizing is really what I think of it. It's not something you have, it's something you do. And who the people are that are strategizing, what their information is, are they learning, what's the context, it matters a whole lot because, like we say, it's a verb, it's not a noun. Uh, you know, I've been quoting Eisenhower, of all people, who, who uh, after D-Day, uh, said, planning's really important, but plans are useless. And his point being that once you get into the action, so then thinking of strategy as that kind of ongoing activity, you can't do it without organization. You, know, you can't, you, you know, oh, and the internet. Well, internet's great for mobilizing, not so much for strategizing unless you have a set of people you work with that you develop relationships with and that are doing, does this make sense what I'm saying? Because the problem so often happens that, you know, that general up on the hill and then those soldiers down in the valley, uh, fog can settle. And so the one on the hill thinks they've got the whole truth. And the people in the valley think they got the whole truth. The reality is neither one has the whole truth without the other. Context is so important for strategy, but so is being able to put the context in context. That's what the general gets. And so we need each other, and it's tragic how much uh, struggle there goes on. No, we got the whole truth because we're in X. No, I got the whole truth because we're in the Capitol. We Does that sound familiar at all? In the States, it's a big problem. So I guess what I'm saying is that you need organization to be able to develop strategy and then make choices about tactics. Because we confuse activity, rally. Is that a tactic? It's a tactic if it's strategic. Otherwise, it's just an action. It's not a tactic unless it's strategic. I mean, this distinction is really important, but it means then we have to create venues where strategizing actually goes on. Does this make sense? <laughs> and this is good. Yeah. I think we have uh, time perhaps for, for one last comment and just to perhaps wrap up, Marshall, this organizing of which you speak, it's an event, right? You all of a sudden you know how to do it and you head out and you ride the bicycle along and you're good to go? Well, actually it's a pill we can give you. You take the pill and... No, look, I mean the whole deal is it is like learning to ride a bicycle. You know, uh, studying bicyclology doesn't get you there. Uh, and, and, and it is getting on the bike, it's falling, it's understanding that falling is a part of how you learn to keep your balance, and that's how it works. So I, what I really want to emphasize is learning. See, and I'm not talking about learning in a classroom, I'm talking about the learning we have to be doing constantly to be able to deal with the kinds of challenges that we're dealing with, because this is a, this is a, there, there's so much uncertainty. And so it's, it's a different context. And following some old blueprint is not going to get us there. Uh, it's roadmaps that we need. Who do we work with? What are the values driving us? What, how do we see what we can do, try it, and learn from it? So for me, sustained ongoing learning. But to have sustained learning, you have to have respect. Because if in a group, uh, it's all a competition about who was right, who was wrong, or who gets more points, the, that's judgment, that's not learning. And so respect is a condition, I think, for sustained learning. And I just think we have to build that into our organizations, we build it into everything we do. Uh, when we do uh, campaigns or pri in classes, at the end of every class, we have what we call pluses, deltas, and takeaways. Uh, in other words, here's an opportunity. What worked? What didn't? What can work better? What are we learning? So that it's not a one-time thing. It's just part of the practice. We really need that now. We're not going to find our way out of this, but we can find our way out of this if we make these kinds of commitments. Thanks, Marshall. And just in, in closing, as a comment to wrap up, uh, Cornell West has a famous saying, he says, let the phones be smart, I want to be wise. And so because we live still in this age of kind of one-pagers and bullets and takeaways, I was wondering if you had a short list of wisdom that you would like for us to, to, to leave here with uh, as we go forward tonight. How would you sum, uh, sum things up for us? Take us home. 
Yo, Lord. Yeah, who's got some wisdom out there? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Just shout out. Who's got some wisdom out there? Some no takeaways. Wisdom? Come on. What are some takeaways of your own from the conversation we did? All right, what else? What else? What else? Sharing and care. What else back there? Fail wisely. Yeah, that's really good. That's great. What else? But, yeah, there's a lot of wisdom here. That's the wisdom is to recognize that, I think, and to then build from that. For me, that's what I would say. Sounds like we already have it within us yeah. and, and in the yeah. room. Yeah. Uh, I feel a bit like the Beastie Boys because we're up here with two mics on each side of the stage. Uh, so <laughs> if you'll help me thank Marshall Gans for coming. Um, Do you want to come up? Okay. We're all Thank you so much, Marshall. Thank you. This was a real treat. Everybody, just one more time before we go, let's all say thank you and show our appreciation for Marshall. This has been a lot of work in the making. You know what? I've, we, and, and you know, I also got to say, Marshall, you, you don't do it alone. You organize well. So thank you to Alyssa and Emily, people on your staff team who made this possible, and Sarah, and everybody else, you know what, I've got a few thank yous to make. And really quickly, let's all remember we're here for the David Lewis Lecture. It's the Lewis family that, that really made this possible. And you know, many people, and you'll, you'll be interested to know this, many people in this room tonight actually influenced my career. However, there's one member of the Lewis family who, who made a real impact, and I consider him a mentor of sorts. In fact, Michael Lewis, I know, Michael, you don't like the spotlight, but I do want to say thank you to you. I wouldn't be here tonight. None of this would have happened if it wasn't for you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Also, too, let's thank all of our sponsors. The UA Local 46, they're in the front row. Thank you for your, uh, your founding support. The Ontario English Catholic Teachers, thank you for, to them. ATU 113, everybody needs a bus and a subway. Let's thank them. And then also, too, the Iron Workers Local 721 for their sponsorship of this event. Uh, thank you all for being here. Please join us. We have a reception. Please eat the food and uh, have some good to drink because it's all paid for. Thank you. Have a good night. Marshall, I'd like you to meet. Uh...